So after the pill was placed and everything was working and the IV was doing its thing, um, she explained to me that the magnesium I was put on was to help me stay relaxed, to help my blood pressure stay down, and to prevent any seizures that might happen. Um, because like she had said earlier, you know, a seizure could be the end of both of us. Um, so I, <clears throat> I get a, a text from my mom asking me if I had heard from one of my sisters that she'd called her at the church that she works at and no one had answered and she'd been calling her cell phone and she wasn't answering because she works with children, she doesn't usually have her phone on you, on her. So I called the church that she works at and I let her know what was happening so the the woman who answered the phone said that she'll get that message to her and she'll make sure she gives someone a call back and they'll, they'll let her leave so she can get up here. Um, and then about an hour or so after that, I got a text from my youngest sister saying that they're getting ready to leave and they'll be here sometime in the morning. Um, every hour that I was in the hospital, from the moment I was admitted until I was released, I had to have my blood pressure done every hour and I didn't realize if you move, even if you're moving right before it starts, <laughs> it starts to, automa to automatically take your blood pressure, it gets even tighter. So I actually have some marks on my arms from blood vessels that have burst in my arm because it got so tight. Because I was on the magnesium, I never put that connection together until it had worn off of me two days after I gave birth to her. And I was like, oh, so that's why that was happening. That would have been nice if someone had told me not to move. Um, I do talk with my hands a lot. Um, you can't see because they're cut off, but it's moving almost the entire time I'm explaining this. Um, when the, the nurse... Yeah. When the nurse came in to check on us, um, I asked her if I could have something to eat because it was now about 5.30, 6 o'clock, and I hadn't eaten anything since dinner the night before because I was running late that morning and forgot breakfast, and then I had planned on getting lunch on my way back from the doctor's office that day. Um, so I hadn't had anything in what had been about 24 hours now, and she told me that no, they can't let us have any let me have anything solid because, you know, if they started the induction, I could go into active labor at any moment, um, but she could give, she could give me broth, jello, a popsicle, ginger, ginger ale, Sprite, anything that was a clear liquid, and I was like, okay, well, it's better than nothing. Um, and they wouldn't let me watch TV because of my seizure risk and you know certain light patterns and flashing patterns can cause seizures so I wasn't able to watch any TV so I sat in a hospital bed without any kind of entertainment they didn't want me on my phone unless I was you know answering an emergency text so it was very very boring they had two monitors hooked up to my belly, one to monitor the contractions and one to monitor her heart rate. Um, it was very interesting watching the contractions, the little like, blip or whatever, getting higher and lower as they came, and then watching her heartbeat. But she moved so much that it was constantly losing her heartbeat. And the nurses thought I was the, <laughs> that I was the one who was moving and causing it to fall off of me. And I was like, nope, nope, it's her. She's kicking it off. She's moving away from it. She's done this my whole pregnancy. So they um, come in about, I think it was about nine o'clock now to check my cervix. I was not dilated at all. It had opened up to where they could kind of stick their fingertip in it, but not, not much more. So they told me that, um, they were going to put another piece of that pill in and they would come back and check in, a, in several hours. I think they came back at around 3 o'clock in the morning and checked. And I think I was dilated to a 2 when they checked at that time. And so I just, I just went to sleep between that check and the next one. Woke up every hour with the, the blood pressure monitoring. But 
tried to sleep as much as I could because I knew once she, once she got here that there wouldn't be much of that happening anymore. <laughs> um, my husband, bless his heart, he slept in a recliner right next to me. He only left twice the entire time I was in the hospital. Um, he did have to call his sergeant and let him know that he probably won't be back to work for a couple of days. He wasn't sure when he would, when the baby would come, when he'd be able to return back from work. But luckily, the, de the department that he works for, they have amazing parental leave. So he was able to take all the time he needed off to be with me and hers, even after she was born. <laughs> Can't get anything done. <laughs> At about 3.45 in the morning, they came in um, to place the next part of the pill. Um, and this time, because it was so painful the last time, they gave me um, some fentanyl so that I wouldn't feel it as bad because it was so painful. Um, so they checked everything and I was um, dilated to a, almost to a two. And, um, my contractions were finally starting to become more steady, more like you're starting to go into labor type contractions, um, which was a good sign. Um, everything, was, everything was starting to move along despite the magnesium which was working against everything. Um, at that point was when I lost all sense of time. Um, I did not know what time it was at any given time of the day. I didn't, they had to keep everything dark because they wanted me to stay as relaxed as possible. So I couldn't even tell if it was light or dark out. And even though the shades let some light through, it was during um, that hurricane. I can't remember what, Hurricane Florence. So we were getting hit with a lot of rain and it was incredibly cloudy and we couldn't see anything anyways. So, I mean, there was no way to tell what time of day it was unless you looked at a clock. Um, the magnesium did make me so hot that I froze everybody who came into the room. The nurses would put on jackets before they came in to check my vitals. It was so cold in there. Um, I could hardly walk because my muscles were relax relaxed so much. Um, and I was still needing a fan. I was so hot. And I had that AC set at, I think it was like 64. That's how cold it was in that room. And I was still sweating half to death. Um, my parents got there at about 9 o'clock that morning, which is amazing because of how far away Texas is from North Carolina. Um, and my mother-in-law, who was traveling from Alaska, made it there a few hours later, which was another amazing feat because it takes two days, typically, to, what are you reaching for? To travel from their little remote island in Alaska to, um, to North Carolina. They have to board a three-hour ferry or catch a, a small island hopper plane over to the next island, which has the the small airport on it and then they take a plane from there over to Seattle and from Seattle they have a couple of stops of where they get here but the schedules they don't match up with the plane schedules much at all so I mean you can leave at six o'clock in the morning and not actually get on a plane until late that night or the early the next morning um, so after my family got here and they said hello, my husband, he brought them back to, <laughs> back to our home so they could rest a little bit because they drove through the night. Um, and while they, he, he did that, my mother-in-law went to go stay with her parents um, and get fresh enough as well because she was on a plane from early that morning before until that early afternoon. Yeah. Um, after my family came in um, from resting, 
Mm. We played some games that I did very, very poorly at because I was so out of it from the magnesium. I just could not think fast enough for any of these games. One of which was Go Fish. I could not think fast enough to play a children's game. Yeah. Um, and then they came in, the doctor and nurse came in periodically to check my cervix throughout the day and it was not dilating. Um, at about nine o'clock, when they came in to check it before, for the last time that evening, it still wasn't dilated and I was starving because it had been a long time. I can't remember how many hours now since I had eaten a real meal. And when I found out I wasn't dilated enough to do anything or I wasn't even progressing, I just burst into tears and I was so frustrated and I was so hungry. The nurse kind of took pity on me, so she asked my husband, you know, what kind of foods does she like? And he said, you know, it's late, whatever foods that are left at the cafeteria, you know, she'll eat anything, she's not picky. So she came back about 30 minutes later with chicken strips, a salad, I think there was a burger, a milkshake, a cookie, soda, and um, french fries. And my husband, bless his heart, he didn't eat anything. If I can eat something, then he was eating anything. And I offered him some of the food and he told me, I'll eat whatever you leave me. And I feel so bad because I only left him one chicken strip and the milkshake. I was so hungry, I devoured everything else. Um, so after I ate, I fell asleep and I slept until, you know, they came in and checked on my vitals or they did the, the blood pressure every hour. Um, so at this point, this was day two in the hospital waiting for this one here to decide to come. 